All right, ladies and gentlemen, time once again for the only coast-to-coast -coast radio show that's all about the information economy. It's time for Inside Analysis. Yours truly, Eric Cavanaugh, is here with, a, with several wonderful guests, folks. We're going to talk about a really interesting topic. It's been around for a long time. This subject's been around for years, for decades, quite frankly, but it's really finally starting to crystallize. And what that thing is we're going to talk about is called Web 3.0. So you've heard uh, of this 3.0, 2.0. Of course, that's a reference to software and software releases. But what is Web 3.0? We're going to be talking to Stefan Verbant from Protocol Labs and also Peter Maddox from Seagate and another, another guest later on in the show. And we want to talk about what this thing is and, and really why it matters to you. So I've been in this industry for a long, long time now, and I've seen trends come and go. And like I say, we've heard this term Web 3.0 for many years now. Most of the conversations have been around semantics. So people talk about the so-called semantic web, and that is part of the conversation, but really distributed is the key. And if you think about, we just talked about this yesterday on a show. Um, if you think about the whole architecture of the internet from the, from the get-go of ARPANET, the whole idea was to create a communications network that would survive any node being killed, right? That was the whole idea is to have some communication network in place that would be durable enough to survive through some sort of travesty, right? Well, that was the beginning. That's a long time ago now. And uh, if you look at the web, well, it's, I mean, it's distributed in that you have lots of different websites you can go to, but every website, in a sense, is a sort of single point of failure. Now, there is some redundancy involved, like Cloudflare, for example. There are different things that people do to in enable true redundancy and true resiliency. But nonetheless, these are static IP addresses, typically, that you go to to get a website. Well, a distributed web is a much different thing. And we're going to hear from Stefan here in a second about the storage side of that equation. And also our friend from Seagate is on the call here. We'll talk about that as well. But if you think about a truly distributed web, now you don't have a single point of failure. Now you do have this truly federated environment. And we're not talking just storage. So the, the first step of this process is storage. But we're also going to talk about compute. We're also going to talk about the full stack for delivering apps or d apps as some people call these things distributed apps you know blockchain is out there so people understand a bit more about what blockchain is of course there are many different blockchains it's not just the one that underpins bitcoin and we'll also talk about filecoin and what filecoin is and why it matters so with that brief intro let me bring in stefan uh Vervant from protocol labs tell us a bit about the genesis of this and what protocol labs is doing to enable web 3.0 yeah, thank you, Eric. So um, my name is Stefan. I'm head of uh, network growth here at Protocol Labs. Um, our goal is to grow the network. And if you look at the Falcon network, it's really a perfect implement, a perfect demonstration of how to drive utility um, that is, you know, enabled by blockchain technology. As Eric, you were mentioning um, today, HTTP is the preferred uh, protocol of choice on how to address and find information on the web. Um, we've sort of like um, replaced that with a cryptographic hash. So instead of addressing data by an IP address, um, um, we are actually um, using uh, a cryptographic hash that is so secure that you can uh, be guaranteed that that cryptographic hash is the only hash that represents that particular data set that you're looking for. And so the second part we've changed is that um, the way you actually get to that um, content is no longer, you don't no longer need to know exactly where the data is stored. You actually, you know, connect into this federated storage stack, um, which is a decentralized network where um, that hash will eventually uh, pull back the data source or the, the, the actual data copy that you're looking for. And so you can pull that data back from anywhere in the, anywhere in the world. So you go to one of the gateways and that will get, give you back the, the location of where your data is actually stored. So that changes a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways, how we interact today. Mm -hmm. um, it makes things a lot more stateless, meaning you can actually um, build true decentralized apps that are running across the globe, across multiple, you know, systems um, that are owned by different entities and you're not really locked into a single let's say public cloud vendor anymore that dictates, you know, which APIs and 
which locations that you can host your data sets or your application. No, right now you actually have a lot more choice because you'll have choice of thousands of, or, or eventually millions of systems out there that will give you the opportunity to store you know, your data set with them. Um, and, and so, you know, it opens up um, a, a bunch of new opportunities and thanks to the underlying blockchain technology, what is so really, what, what's so really powerful is that you essentially move from a, a world where you're trusting these central large entities um, to hold your assets to trusting the code itself. And so what we're mm -hmm. saying is code is law. Uh, why? Because the code is so <laughs> the code is so um, secure, and that that essentially anyone can do peer to peer transactions with anyone else in the network, and be guaranteed that that transaction will be done safely and secure. And you know, so there's and there's a lot of other um, characteristics that we specifically uh, enabled uh, that we have enabled in in the Falcon stack that go one step further. So not just um, having the ability to transact, but also having the security that the data that you're storing is is really um, in the, the the integrity of that data is really kept. And so there's there's a couple of things we can talk about. But you know, on its premise, right, Web three is sort of like this new era, this new wave, this new um, technology stack um, that will that is enabling uh, us to to be able to do these peer to peer transactions and and eventually, you know, creates a ton more innovation than what you're seeing today in a traditional web too. Yeah, this is very interesting stuff. And if you would quickly explain Filecoin, when you talk about the Filecoin stack, what goes into that? Um, and obviously Filecoin is this storage network, basically, but explain what you mean when you say the Filecoin stack. Yeah, so Filecoin is um, the largest decentralized storage stack today or network. It's really a network of systems. Um, today, we have more than 4,000 systems globally deployed across 44 different countries that are running an open source version of Falcon. And Falcon comes in, we have four um, implementations, again, again for redundancy. Um, and so what it allows um, these storage providers, as we call them, right? To do is um, they will they are contributing to the network, and by pledging capacity, so storage capacity mm -hmm. and Falcon tokens, um, and that generates this. You know, right now we have close to fifteen petabytes, sorry, fifteen exabytes. Let me just fifteen exabytes of actual capacity on the network wow. um, that is fully owned, run, and, and run by the ecosystem. Right, so Purple Labs has doesn't run any of these. Um, so basically these are all startups running the network because they're strong believers and in, in changing how we store data today and then eventually also how we compute data today. So when we're talking about the Falcon stack, it starts with the, uh, the actual storage layer, but today um, we also um, allow for smart contracts to be run on our, our stack and then in the in the near future, we all, we'll also have the ability to compute data, which is basically the end goal. It's not just about storing um, all our precious assets in a more efficient and um, federated, you know, architecture, but also the ability to compute and monetize those assets, and not just monetize it um, from the, the network. Shouldn't be monetizing it. It's actually the users that own the data that should be in charge or should have the control to monetize their own data sets. So really this is also part of us um, building a world where users have more control over their digital assets right. and, and how they actually monetize it down the right. road. Well, this is very interesting. So, you know, I've been a big fan of the open source community for 20 odd years now. Uh, and I spent a lot of time researching and trying to understand the business models, the technologies, um, where things are going. And of course, it's always uh, somewhat in flux, but in, this is very, it's a very compelling storyline. And I remember probably five years ago uh, at a conference, I noticed a lot of the open source people were really focused on censorship 
and uh, and preventing censorship. And it kind of gets to this whole control point side of the equation where someone can just shut you down if they don't like your content, whether it's an authority or it could be just someone in the company. It could be someone in one of these cloud providers that says, no, we don't like you guys. We've actually seen that in the last couple of years. And that's one really interesting storyline around this approach, right? Because there is no one person who could come in and say, no, I don't like what you're doing and shut you down, right? Yeah, yeah that's a very good point. Look at what's happening on the, with Twitter, for example, right? It's a perfect example. With, right. Um, right. It's actually going to result into more uh, similar platforms that are more customized to the audience. Um, and so here in, in, in a decentralized network, you have that flexibility, you have that option because there's no single entity, like you said, that controls what um, what data is stored where. Um, it's actually up to the users and to the storage providers to offer those kind of services and to get into an agreement on what data to store and what data not to store and where to store it. So there's um, th that's why this is an open marketplace and that's exactly what we want to build. Um, we want to build the options for not just to the customers um, to choose where the data is stored, but also for the storage providers to choose what type of services that they would like to offer, um, because there's different SLAs um, that will, you know, will be required. So some customers will want to retrieve their data very fast. And so for that, we have CDN type of solutions that are being built on top of Falcon. Others will just want to have a very cheap and deep large repository that is, you know, meant for storing archives for, you know, a uh, hundred years. So, um, and these come with different configurations. These come with different um, architectures, right? So that's why we're working very closely with, you know, the Seagates of the world and um, AMD to like optimize the architectures for these different tiers, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we've built, you know, also an, an alliance um, recently, uh, which we call the Decentralized Storage Alliance for that reason, so that we could bring the web to um, um, companies like, you know, that are currently selling not just storage, but also services to the existing enterprise market, bring them together and really collaborate on, you know, defining those new architectures and workflows and, and how enterprises could leverage right these these new decentralized storage stacks, which is still very nascent to uh, the enterprise market. Yeah, it is. And, and next up in our next segment, we're going to be talking to Peter Maddox from Seagate. And uh, I found out in the pre-show that uh, Seagate is now moving this project to their go-to-market strategy, which is a huge deal. So it's been an R and D. For a period of time, which also is a great sign. I mean, companies like Seagate don't don't spend their R and D money willy nilly. I mean, they are focused on understanding what's happening in the market, what's happening in the technology space, what do users want, what do what do partners want, etc. A lot goes into those decisions, and the fact that it's now coming out and as part of a go to market strategy is a huge sign. I mean, that's basically the inflection point that pushes it into the mainstream, uh, and it's very very interesting to me. So just to explain our audience here, the idea is instead of going to Amazon or Google or Microsoft or Rackspace or any of these providers to store your data, instead of just buying servers yourself, which is the old fashioned way of storing data, instead of doing that, you will rely on this decentralized storage network to, to host your data. And to Stefan's point, the next step in this process for them, for their uh, own advancement, is the compute side of the equation. So now you're talking about actually being able to store data, to build distributed apps, and then to you know point those apps at the storage network, just like you would point your containers at persistent storage in traditional enterprise computing environments, right, Stefan? Yeah, indeed. So a perfect example um, are NFTs. Um, so one of the benefits, one of the major benefits of storing data in a decentralized network where there's no central or no single entity that fully controls the network is that all data that is stored is immutable and it's verifiable, meaning there's no way that you can change it. And so today we store more than 100 million NFTs for on Falcon. Um, for, uh, for some of the major NFT marketplaces like OpenSea and Rarible and others. But um, the real benefit here is that, you know, it's, it's stored natively in an immutable way. And the second, you can verify the status of the data. So on a daily basis, 
the, the code will actually verify with the service providers and storage providers um, if the, the hash right is still consistent and that if the hash would be inconsistent, you, you would know that that data is no longer consistent and it's no longer the same data that you stored. So there's built-in checks, there's built-in um, sticks as well. You know, if a service provider loses data, he gets penalized by losing Falcorn. I see. So there's a whole ecosystem, yeah. The algorithm is so designed that it's sort of, it's very strict and it guarantees uptime and it guarantees um, a certain, um, and, and integrity, right? Data integrity, which is so crucial when you're storing data. Um, and so you can build these dApps on that. Like I was mentioning the NFTs, right? As a perfect example, um, you know, today we store hundreds, hundreds of millions of, of NFTs on Filecoin, but now with the introduction of the virtual machine, which is the ability to compute um, a state of data, basically. So you can build intelligence um, and store that on the, on the stack. So you can then eventually mint your NFTs as well on Filecoin. And then... Mm -hmm. The second step beyond that is now that you have stored your data on Filecoin, you can run analytics um, in a distributed way as well. So mm -hmm. there's multiple startups um, and we ourselves are building capabilities as well to enable compute on top of data that's stored on Filecoin. Yeah. And so right. here, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Just real quick, uh, one minute before the break. Is there a standard or default number of copies? Like with Hadoop, it was three out of the box. Is there a standard number of copies that you store or can you choose that? Uh, you can choose that. Um, but by default right now, we're seeing five to six copies by the on-ramps okay. that are stored in data on Falcon. I see. Okay, good. This is uh, this is really fascinating stuff, folks, I have to tell you. So we're talking today with uh, Stefan Vervat from Protocol Labs, all about this new decentralized Web 3.0, I'd mentioned that semantics is what we used to always call Web 3.0, and semantics is part of the equation, but really it's all around distribution, no single point of failure. This is something that you hear a lot in the enterprise software world. Single point of failure means, you know, if I pull the plug on this one box, it's over. <laughs> the whole system comes crashing down. You don't want that. Nobody wants that. You don't want that in the enterprise. You don't want that in small business. You don't want that for your NFTs or for whatever. You want to have durability, resilience. You want to know that it's there. You want to know that it's secure. And what's interesting is these folks have really thought through that entire process from, from start to finish. So that's why it is so robust. And folks, don't touch that. I'll be right back. You are listening to Inside Analysis. All right, folks, back here on Inside Analysis, talking all about Web 3.0, the distributed web, the semantic web. What does it all mean? Well, next up, we have a hardware guy. I'm a hardware geek. I'm not going to lie. I get into this stuff. I just think it's fascinating how much advances how much advance we've made in terms of designing hardware managing hardware understanding hardware you know the observability on you know on how it works how it how it doesn't work is uh, it's just tremendous these days and now we've got peter maddox on the line from seagate so peter welcome to the show welcome to inside analysis i know you're kind of new to this distributed stuff but you're an old hat at storage um, tell us a bit about what, what's going on. You told me before the show that this was an R&D. Now it's being moved into go-to-market strategy. I mean, for, as an industry guy, you know that's a big deal, right? Absolutely. Thanks, Eric. Nice nice to be uh, on your panel. And uh, yeah, excited to, to talk about what Seagate's doing in this space. Um, you know, we, we've been around in storage for, for over 40 years now. And um, the, you can see the, the evolution of storage architectures as we go, you know, from... from um, mainframe client client server or web two and now web three and um it, it is uh absolutely the case where seagate has recognized the importance of the decentralized architecture with web three to the point where we are um, organizing around that from a go-to-market uh perspective and and you know working closely with um with the dsa and uh teams like stefan's to to bring solutions to market uh in in this space and uh, it's it's very complementary to um, our next generation of Seagate uh, storage devices, as well as our systems. Um, I'd say kind of the, the overarching theme is to, to try, try to bring the, um, the benefits of the hyperscale um, 
cost per terabyte uh, type of metrics uh, into this uh, decentralized architecture um, so that um, smaller industry players can benefit from those same kind of, of cost improvements architecturally that, that uh, we've traditionally placed in the, um, you know, in the hyperscale uh, cloud providers and looking to provide that uh, to the decentralized market as well. Yeah, and of course, a lot has changed, right? I mean, we traditional data centers. I, I personally believe that the uh, the rumors of traditional data centers have been exaggerated. I think that a lot of them are <laughs> going to stick around for a good long while now, in part just for accounting purposes, amortization, things of this nature. I mean, you're not just going to lop it off and move on. Uh, but I also wonder if we're going to see a, a renaissance in how data centers are used and if this could play a role in that. So if you think about companies moving to the cloud, you know, certain aspects of, of corporate operations have already moved to the cloud. You look at all the software as a service stuff. I mean, Salesforce, of course, is the poster child in that game, and they're over 20 years old. I've been doing that for a long freaking time now. Um, but uh, I kind of see this as a really interesting enabling technology and approach for extending the life of traditional data centers. What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. We we look at this inside of Seagate as um, you know, something we call the rise of the edge. And um, with the um, you know, explosion of IoT and and peer-to-peer uh, communication, you know, we see this as a uh, a very complementary theme to uh, the traditional enterprise, and um, I think to your point, uh, both are going to exist for for a long time. And and uh, w- what we see that's exciting is the ability to take some of the technologies we've invested in in that traditional Web 2.0 space and start applying them uh, in different ways over in the the decentralized market. Um, and so I think that's that's where um, we start to get adjacencies that. That are really exciting to uh, to build these you know new opportunities for customers um, that, that didn't exist before. If you're you know if you're looking for for storage options outside of uh, the traditional uh, cloud you know capabilities. So um, one of the uh, real exciting things at Seagate is the um, advent of of 30 terabyte plus uh, hard drives and and uh, once you get to capacities like that you know the the, the um, economics of uh, being able to store that that dense of a uh, storage device inside a system that's part of a decentralized network, um, you know, really pre- presents some exciting opportunities for the growth of, of uh, this this space. Yeah, I, it's really, it's really fascinating. And, you know, of course, one of the keys when you start talking about storage, especially for the enterprise, but also for, you know, small, mid-sized businesses is always going to be performance, right? How quickly can I get my data? For what use case will I use this particular storage engine, for example? And obviously archiving is a big one, right? If you have cold data, you just have to store it for some reason, then this is going to be top of the charts. I'm curious to know on the SLA side, it's going to be very interesting. I mean, we heard Stefan mention SLA service level agreements, basically. Uh, I, I bet some of this stuff can be pretty fast, though. I mean, you guys at Seagate have a whole range of products, right, that can serve we, any of those use cases. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the the ecosystem um, solutions that we're building right now with the, for the uh, decentralized market is uh, using a, a product we call Core Vault um, as one of the foundational um Think of it as a, a unit of storage that would be uh, scaled out across um, as, as many nodes as the user would like uh, to scale. Uh, but that individual component is capable of, um, you know, 12 gigabytes per second of writes and 14 gigabytes per second of reads um, out of 106 drives in a single enclosure. All yeah. of that protected at uh, today, protected at five nines of availability. That means, you know, up, only five minutes of downtime per year. Um, next next generation will be six nines uh, later this year. So uh, really excited about, you know, that is just a, if you think of that as a single, uh, you know, a single point of failure, single component of that scale out architecture and then you know how resilient that looks when you when you go to N nodes. Um, it's, it's very exciting. <laughs> and yeah, our, what, one of our uh, key investments there has been in a um, um, an ASIC com, uh, combined with our data path firmware, uh, which is designed um, to really get the, the maximum throughput and availability at the, a very low cost. So compared to other architectures, um, you know, it's a, it's a very cost-effective approach to, to the uh, space. 
see that that's where the geek in me comes out as you start <laughs> talking about ASICs and uh, the data path firmware. So in ASIC, the first time I learned about ASICs was with uh, Bitcoin, and uh, there were Chinese companies building these machines that were purpose designed to mine for Bit for Bitcoin, right? Which is a very it's a it's a fascinating concept that I think a lot of people really don't understand, including myself. But you know, being unwinding the cryptography to get to the coin requires a tremendous amount of computational power, and so right. what they've done is they purpose built these ASICs to do just that and and only that and it sounds like you guys have some other things going on with this uh ASIC combined with a data prime firmware that's great again for particular use cases when you want to move vast amounts of data from one place to another right exactly exactly yeah and this this uh particular design is all around um you know keeping our uh, active active architecture with with dual controllers in a single node um shared cache where um really maximizing that availability and and uh it's it's you know how we are able to achieve that five nines and now now moving to six nines with our next level of devices so um yeah and, and to your point earlier i think we were talking about how long these investments take um you know th that uh, product set is uh something that's matured over many years and uh you know in the in the traditional enterprise space and now you know being able to apply um this as a part of a, an ecosystem and architecture to decentralized storage is is really exciting yeah and you mentioned edge and let's just explain to the audience what it may, edge means a lot of people now know but you, of course you have these data centers you have cloud providers like amazon and all these other guys but then the edge refers to really anything that's out there that has some connectivity it could be your phone, for example, is on the edge. It could be some technology on an oil rig, for example, is out at the edge. It's anywhere out where something is happening. And you, know, you, you look at like Amazon, they have these big availability zones, but they're pretty big. And so the speed of light actually comes into play in terms of sending messages all the way across and getting messages all the way back. And what I think is very interesting is going to play right into your hands in this particular endeavor is that the, the edge is everywhere. The edge is all over the place. It's all over the place. And the more that we can cater to those needs, those business needs, the more that space is going to grow. And I think you guys are like right in the center of that conversation, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's it's been really interesting to see you know Seagate as a devices company um, is obviously uh, in the cloud, but but we're also uh, you know at the edge and um, you know being able to to take advantage of of being um, you know throughout that ecosystem, uh, particularly for our systems business, has been a, a a really good place to be and and where we're seeing an awful lot of growth you know coming into this this next year um, is out of exactly those those kinds of deployments and. You know, as, as users want to um, approach security in different ways, I think we talked earlier about, um, you know, wanting to control where their data is and, um, you know, um, you see diff different security um, protocols out there and and the need for for businesses to be able to control where uh, from a geographic perspective you know where their data lives um so we we see this decentralized approach as a um, a good alternative to um kind of the traditional hyperscale uh ways of of controlling where your data uh, resides and um you know i think I think the um, approach we've got with systems being part of that architecture um is a is a good part of the solution yeah, that's very interesting. And, um, you know, I've heard some funny stories. Uh, I won't mention the cloud vendor's name, but a very, very big cloud vendor. I've heard stories about uh, them not knowing where stuff is and like really important stuff. And because it's just complicated. I mean, they've just built out racks and racks and racks and racks of servers. And, you know, there's documentation for all that stuff. But, you know, kind of knowing where things go is, uh, is a challenge. And you guys have an interesting... I, I think uh, advantage here in being able to architect this next generation solution. Could you talk quickly about like what kind of things can you do from a hardware design perspective? You mentioned this firmware concept, but from a hardware design perspective, what kind of things can you do to facilitate um, how you interact with this uh, distributed soft storage alliance? Sure. So um, we, we build, um, reference architectures uh working with the the dsa um the, the the decentralized storage alliance um to optimize um you know the the performance 
characteristics specifically for Filecoin um, and you know building out um, a solution with our right now the the work that's going on is is with our uh, core vault architecture um, in in there you know you want to optimize uh, the the specific workload for Filecoin uh, to make sure that you're going to get uh, response times that are um, reliable and and uh, you know it's it's right now it's all about being able to write down that recipe in such a way that it's it's easy to reproduce in the field and uh, combine you know our back end storage with the the right compute uh, to be able to put that overall solution together um, you know we're, we're looking at um, tr trying to make sure that the um, um, particular workload is is optimized in that scenario. Um, so yeah, it's, I think that's that's where the uh, focus is today uh, in our solutions labs. Yeah, right. And uh, you talk about with uh, Core Vault, you talk about self-healing, high density data storage. Self-healing is one of these things we've, of course, Oracle talks about with their database. Um, and there are things that you can do where you do these scans. I mean, Stefan even kind of mentioned that the system is, the, the code is designed to do a scan. Is everything okay? Is everything okay? Okay, everything's fine. That kind of thing. And that's kind of what you're doing in this case too, right? It's, I'm guessing there's some sort of scan that goes, is everything the way it was? And if it wasn't, you go through a sort of step process dynamically to solve things, right? Yeah, we have a um, a, a feature called uh, ADR, Autonomous Drive Regeneration. And essentially what we do is, is if a single device um, has um, any kind of head or surface failure um, that we detect on that device, um, the storage controller inside uh, the core vault is actually creating a pool of, of disks that are part of a, um, a um, like a backup resource. Yeah, exactly. Um, a pool of disks where we can uh, keep a spare capacity uh, capability where we can autonomously regenerate uh, the space on that drive by taking a single head out of service, um, huh. move that capacity over to the rest of the pool, then bring the rest of the services uh, surfaces back online. Um, so you might see the original device come back at maybe 95% of its original capacity. Huh. Um, and then your, uh, your pool of storage is automatically rebalanced over that device. All of this is transparent to the, the end application. So um, you don't see any interruption in service or change in performance while that's happening. Um, and that's so at the, at the end of the day, you see um, you know, a small percentage of capacity in your original pool is gone. Uh, but you're, you know, completely self-healing. No need to pull that uh, drive out of the system and, you know, replace it. Um, it continues as part of the uh, the rest of the pool. So yeah, it's really really an exciting capability for us. Uh, and as you think think about a single device with 30 terabytes on it or more, um, you really need to have those kinds of algorithms in place so that you're not dealing with expensive rebuilds across, right. you know, your entire infrastructure when when a, uh, a device is replaced. So uh, yeah. it's become Becoming a, a really important part of the architecture. That is very, very cool stuff. It, it just goes to show you how you can build upon the successes of the past and kind of learn from mistakes and, and learn how you can leverage these technologies. But that kind of self-healing capacity is huge because, man, when stuff goes down, when you lose data, I mean, the business pain of that is just miserable. But folks, don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. You are listening to Inside Analysis. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, back here on Inside Analysis, talking Web 3.0. We're talking to Stefan Vervat of Protocol Labs and Peter Maddox from Seagate. And Stefan, I'll throw it back over to you. Let's talk about who's using this stuff right now. You said you've got 4,000 instances across 44 countries, and you do have uh, some success. I think you told me the other day in the, uh, in the research space for universities. So who, who's using this technology now, and what's the plan going forward? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, last the last um, eight months, um, we've seen a tremendous uptick in just in general um, customers storing data onto our network. And we've seen research institutes being very um, um, engaged there uh, for a couple of reasons. One, typically in research environments, you have a ton of data that you're uh, trying to capture because you're doing research, you're doing analytics, you're doing yeah, and so every bit that you capture is important. And so uh, you want to be able to preserve that over time so that as your, you know, your compute becomes um, more efficient and your algorithms become better, um, you can actually run those algorithms again over 
uh, even old data sets and train those algorithms to maybe even a better outcome. So um, in research, we've seen uh, customers like um, UC Berkeley storing um, uh, data uh, that is related to dark matter. So research uh, researchers that are you know uh, actually um, uh, researching dark matter, uh, and and their feedback has been like, look, for us, what's important is that every single bit we capture is crucial and important, and so we want to be uh, we want to be sure that the data is is in, is still you know the integrity of data is still preserved. Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly what our solution does. Plus, um, their budgets are also slashed in a lot of cases, or, you know, they would like to spend as much of their budget towards the compute side so they can, right. you know, spend more time on finding insights or finding discoveries. And so the storage aspect sometimes, you know, is sort of left behind. And that's where we come in. And so we're seeing University of Utah, UC Berkeley. Um, we have some, uh, we have Atlas.cern. Which is the large um, um, wow. CERN? Um, yeah, the, they're they're storing um, archives on on um, on Falcon as well. And so, you know, these are just on the Web two side. We have also public data sets uh, like NYC. This New York City is storing some of their public data sets on Falcon and others. And then we have uh, on the Web three side, we have a ton of. Um, startups that are being built right now. We have more than 500 startups being built on wow. top of Filecoin that are in some level of uh, investment or uh, funding stage. Um, and so we at Protocol Labs, we and Falcon Foundation, we invest a ton of resources in helping entrepreneurs build new uh, billion dollar businesses, as we say here at PL, right, on top of Falcon. And we have anything that that you can imagine of, like you know, we have an alternative for Spotify, for YouTube, for um, you know, pretty much any app that you know of today. I mean, there's even apps that are replacing Uber, so it is being built right now, and so we are investing heavily in enabling that pipeline of startups, right, on, that are built that are built on top of Filecoin, and at the same time, we're also reaching out to the Web two community to like, you know, bridge and sort of like help them bring those large archives, those large data sets um, onto the Falcon network. And then, you know, we have NFT marketplaces and um, that are very specific, uh, you know, around the NFT ecosystem. But um, yeah, a ton of use cases are um, coming up. And then what, where do we go next, right? It's a good question. So uh, a lot of our roadmap, as we discussed in the previous section, is focused on enabling uh, users to actually compute the data. Um, and the second part is also um, enabling what we would call like, uh, you know, the smart contract capability, which allows for uh, data DAOs, uh, which are these uh, autonomous organizations that uh, organize and operate and govern a set of data assets, right? So now you can sort of like pool your uh, funds together um, as, as a community. So basically, let's say you want to rally the community around a certain data sets that you want to be that you want to preserve, then you know the community could rally around that they could fund that and that could become its own DAO, data DAO. Um, and so there's a lot more newer structures that can be built on a decentralized net that you cannot build on web two. So we're very excited about that because that's opening up a ton more opportunities uh, where the community can actually fund um, you know, a, an initiative that they're that they're behind. Yeah, that's interesting. And you said you provide grants too, like five k up to a hundred thousand dollar grants for people to. I, I'm presuming here to build D apps on top of Filecoin. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So go to the uh, Filecoin website, look for grants, and you'll actually see that we uh, hand out five thousand dollar grants up to a hundred thousand. Kind of depends on what stage. Uh, we run up to 30 hackathons a quarter. So if you want to participate and build, uh, please join us at any of the conferences. Uh, typically, we'll follow the Ethereum conferences because we work very closely with that ecosystem. I see. Um, and the type of developers, I mean, there's only a certain amount of pool of developers out there. And so we travel uh, at the, to the same conferences. And so, you know, even if you come to one of our conferences, you're probably going to meet the whole ecosystem anyway. So, you know, we provide excel we provide hackathons where we provide prizes, but also we follow up with grants for those that we feel like have a lot of potential. And then we have accelerator programs 
um, where you can actually file for a you know, specific accelerator program. For example, we have one with Techstars, we have one with Outlet Ventures, and there we also fund, we help um, these startups by uh, raising funds. So, you know, so we really, we really help these entrepreneurs to build their business on top of our stack. Yeah, that, that's very cool. And uh, real quick, the, the blockchain, uh, do you sit on top of Ethereum or does it matter which blockchain? No, what's cool is that um, today, we, so I, Falcon is a layer zero and now also a layer one. Okay. Uh, what I mean by that is that Falcon actually now has a virtual machine that is equivalent to the Ethereum virtual machine. So we call it the Falcon virtual machine is called FVM, but our first implementation is an Ethereum implementation, which means that you can port your Ethereum apps onto Filecoin. Uh, oh, and it's, it's transparent so that um, you can now, you know, store, you store your data and you can also run your dApps on top of um, uh, our Filecoin EVM yeah, uh, very, implementation. Very cool. So yeah, yeah. That's, that's very cool. And uh, we only have a couple of minutes left. I'll bring uh, Peter back into the conversation. Um, th this is very exciting stuff. I mean, we're talking about a whole new way of doing things where you don't have the single point of failure. And I think the cost is going to be less than what you would pay going to, you know, Google or Amazon or some of these other guys. Uh, what advice do you have, uh, Peter, for companies looking to innovate who are trying to learn more about this? What are your thoughts on the trajectory of this whole concept? Yeah, I think, you know, Stefan's point about the community is is right on. I think there's there's so many uh, conferences to engage. And, um, you know, I've um, as, as Seagate's been part of this DSA, we see uh, more and more enterprises, um, you know, coming and be, being part of the partnership. And, you know, I think um, to, to keep looking um, through through the ecosystem um, of partners, you're going to see solutions starting to be published. Um, you know, I know on uh, Seagate, you know, you'll see several uh, white papers and reference architectures coming out this year that are specifically in this this space. Um, and, you know, I, I'm here right now at the, the ESPA conference, uh, Web3 conference here in, in Vegas this week. And so there's, there's definitely an, an active community of enterprises that are, um, you know, collaborating to build these solutions together. So, you know, I would say just just stay tuned uh, to that community for, um, you know, new solutions being published. But I think that the goal, I think, overall is to make this um, very turnkey and, and uh, easy to deploy um, with without having to go do your own research and, and figure out how to, you know, tune and optimize a solution. We're, we're really looking to be able to, to make it easy to uh, to build this, um, you know, scale out architecture. Yeah, that, that's very, very cool. I've got about a minute and 20 seconds left. Stefan, I'll throw it back over to you. Cost, any any metrics you can throw out there about what it costs to store versus what it costs in traditional uh, storage arrays and so forth? Anything you can share? Um, yeah, I think right, like right now, the storing data on Falcon is pretty much free. Um, and it's <laughs> because it's been subsidized by the, the token. Um, and so what you'll see is that multiple storage providers will provide a um, data to be stored for free for the next year and a half or sometimes longer, and then they'll start charging uh, to store that data. But it's, it's you know, still, um, yeah, it's so much less expensive just because it's been subsidized with this token. And then second, um, also our storage providers are looking for new customers and we're taking sort of a similar approach where um, the cloud providers, you know, initially have, handed out credits right, um, so you right. can sort of like take, <laughs> take, take the same idea here basically right but it's um, the credits are actually used to fund the um, hardware architectures to run and operate a file coin system I so yeah that. lots of opportunity if you're trying to reduce your cost please um, go to falcon.io and also if you want to become a participant in this ecosystem as mm -hmm. what um, peter was saying uh, we actually are running accelerator programs on how to become a storage provider as well. So if you're the ideal company would be someone who has customers who's currently a service provider, wants to get into Web3, doesn't know how to, we have a dedicated seven month program with it. all the support you need from existing storage providers. So. All right, folks, look up filecoin.io and protocol labs. And of course, Seagate, you've been listening to Inside Analysis.